This video lecture serves as an introduction to two factors that impact structural design, statics and the environment. Support for the development of this lesson has been provided by the National Science Foundation through the Ohio University Boat of Knowledge and the Science Classroom Program. What factors do you think engineers had to consider when designing the world's tallest building, which reaches over half a mile high? What about these man-made dams? What would you need to consider in order to build a dam that's a mile and a half wide or 984 feet tall? Humans aren't the only impressive builders. Beavers in Canada have built a dam that measures over half a mile and they're still adding on. How would you design a bridge that stands 1,125 feet tall? like the Malau Viaduct Bridge, or one that stretches five miles like the Sutong Bridge. What might change as a result of building these structures? Many of the factors that you mentioned in the previous slides probably related to one of these categories, physics or the environment. It goes without saying that the buildings, dams, and bridges we design must be structurally sound and adhere to the laws of physics but we also must design with sustainability and environmental preservation in mind. Let's start with the static side of design. We know that structures carry loads, like cars and people. Loads are forces, but what is a force? A force is a vector quantity, meaning it has both magnitude and direction. For example, let's look at this force vector. How would we define this force? Do we just say this force is 13 newtons? No, because force is a vector, and the direction of the force plays a huge role when it comes to calculations. Instead, we should say that this force is 13 newtons at 28 degrees north of east. So how do we relate forces to structural design? This is where Newton's second law comes into the picture. Newton's second law states that the acceleration of an object is dependent on two variables, the net force exerted on the object and the mass of the object. If we want to write acceleration as a function of net force and mass, how would we write the equation? We'll use the units to figure this out. Acceleration has units of meters per second squared, mass has units of kilograms, and force has units of newtons, which can also be written as kilogram meters per second squared. How should we arrange mass and net force on the right side of the equation to get acceleration units? We should put net force in the numerator and mass in the denominator so that kilograms cancel and we end up with units of meters per second squared. We can rearrange this equation to a more useful form where some of the forces equals mass times acceleration. How does this equation relate to structural design? We know that structures aren't moving. So first we should answer the question, what if there is no motion? If there is no motion, that means acceleration must be zero. Therefore, since acceleration is zero, the sum of the forces must also be zero. This is the definition of static equilibrium. The idea that all forces must sum to zero is the basis of structural design. Let's try an activity. Gather the following materials and build a bridge that can hold up a box of 25 pennies. You will need to use the styrofoam as the foundation for the piers. You should place the cups of sand in the pan first, then bury the styrofoam in the cups just like foundation is buried in the ground, then build the bridge between them. Any sand that falls into the aluminum pan during the construction or testing process must stay in the pan. You are not required to use all of the materials provided in order to build your bridge. You will have 15 minutes to complete your design and construct your bridge. Pause the video until the time is up. What have you accomplished within the 15 minute time limit? How much sand is in your pan? Did you do anything to try to keep the sand from falling out of the cup? When did most of the sand fall out of the cup? How do you think this activity pertains to building real bridges?
The reality of bridge building and construction of any structure is that it changes the environment, often in ways we don't desire. Think about the sand that fell out of your cups. Now imagine what happens on a large scale if sand and soil falls into the water. We have just contributed to a problem called turbidity. Turbidity doesn't just make the water muddy, it decreases visibility in the water and clogs fish gills. Think back to your activity. What did you do that contributed to the loss of sand from the cups? When did you lose sand? Was it during construction or after completion? What do you think you could do to mitigate soil erosion and sedimentation that causes turbidity? What could you have done to keep more of the sand inside your cup? You could use best management practices during construction, like silt fences, to collect most of the sediments while allowing cleaner water to pass through. You could also restore the existing channel surface back to its original condition by reseeding and adding topsoil. We notice from these two examples that we can try to prevent the problem during construction or remediate the problem after construction. Will we encounter environmental problems only during construction or after completion too? During construction, we remove some soil when we excavate. Because excavation removes the vegetation and disrupts the compaction of the soil, we get erosion. Notice how the excavated land in the picture looks different from the natural terrain. The eroding soil will eventually be carried down into the river, much like the sand falling from the cup. What else can you think of that happens during construction that impacts the environment? Remember that environmental impacts are not just limited to turbidity. When we construct piers, we are inadvertently changing the aquatic habitat and redirecting the water flow. By changing the water flow, piers contribute to flooding and turbidity because currents tend to swirl around the piers and carry away some of the surrounding soil. Can you think of any other ways construction might impact the environment? The construction phase involves a lot of materials that are harmful to the environment, like gasoline and diesel salt and concrete. After construction is completed, we still have the presence of hazardous materials, like oils and pavements. Is there anything else that would be an ongoing source of environmental disruption after construction? We have now introduced cars into the picture, and along with cars comes noise pollution and air pollution. Noise is certainly an annoyance, but why would noise be considered pollution? Noise is a problem for bird watchers and sleep centers because it disrupts the activities, but noise is also a problem for residential areas since prolonged exposure to high noise levels can be damaging to the auditory system. After construction, we also have to worry about maintenance, like painting and resurfacing. During maintenance activities, precautions must be taken to avoid further damage to the environment. For instance, when a bridge is being painted, it must be covered with tarps to prevent any paint from falling in the water. Some additional environmental concerns include habitat removal for endangered or threatened species like the Indiana bat, displacement of residences and businesses, and destruction of historical and archaeological sites like battlefields and Indian mounds. Now that you've completed the lesson, follow the instructions included as part of the lesson plan materials to construct a toothpick bridge. But remember, your bridge must stand up to more than just the forces it needs to carry. It must also meet environmental standards. You must account for at least one of the following environmental concerns in your design.